Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Perfect RIA Podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Jarvis, and with me on today's edition of What Works Wednesday, we have financial advisor and fellow podcaster, Dave Zagel. Dave, how are you today? Fantastic, Matthew. Thank you for having me on the show. Well, I appreciate you being on the show. One of my favorite things that we developed in this podcast is to talk to other very successful financial advisors like yourself to hear what works, what what didn't work, right? That's equally important. And then kind of the advice that you have for others. So tell us a little bit about, of course, you have both a financial planning firm and an accounting firm. So give us a little bit of background on where you're at and we'll dive right in. Yeah, absolutely. I started my career really with the traditional accounting path. So came out of school with the accounting degree, got the CPA, went to big four accounting and on to corporate world, but, you know, got to about 10 years into that and decided that I wanted to shift and move into financial planning. And I you know, incorrectly thought, oh, that would be easy. You know, I've got all this knowledge. <laughs> I got my CPA. Everybody will want to come talk to me. And as you know, that is not how that works. Uh, but so started out for a couple of years at Mass Mutual at the local office here. Uh, good people. Um, they really were we're doing good things for for clients, but you ultimately said, you know, that's not the business model I wanted to operate in. Um, so went out and went independent and did so in conjunction with my partner, Dennis Fry, uh, late in 2015. And as you said, we've built uh, the accounting firm and financial planning firm side by side ever since. Well, I love that. It's an interesting thing. So even with your background of, of accounting, which does certainly make you an above average advisor, lets you deliver a lot of tax value that other people are missing. That alone, though, however, wasn't just enough for people to come beating down your door, right? I think sometimes we get no. our mind, if only I had this designation, or sometimes we use it as a victim thing. Like, of course, Dave has clients because he's got an accounting background, but you still had to go yeah. through every step along the way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it has been really helpful to have that for background, sure. but from a a marketing and business development perspective, that only goes so far. It's not that, you know, you if you build it, they will come. That's not how that works. <laughs> you can't just say, oh, I have this designation and now they're going to show up. You still have to go through all the steps of, you know, getting your message out there over time and, and providing massive value like you guys talk about. It's just the designations are very helpful, but that's certainly not everything. No, it's certainly no silver bullet, if, if only because there are no silver bullets. Now, right. Dave, something you and I to spoke about before we hit record is that while you had basically twice the work building an accounting firm and a financial planning firm at the same time, that that really created a, a forcing mechanism that in hindsight kept you from playing office quite a bit. And you're actually quite passionate about having forcing mechanisms in place to prevent playing office. Absolutely. When, when my partner Dennis and I got together, you know, I knew that it was really hard to develop a financial branding practice from scratch, and that was going to yeah. take some time. So I said, well, I can do accounting work in the meantime. And actually, I specifically started the firm in December of 2015, knowing that January, February, March was coming up. Um, and even though my partner, he had started his accounting firm maybe a year before that. Um, so I knew that he didn't necessarily have a lot of work. So I actually went and did tax returns for another accounting firm. Um, but that was just a super, super busy time because I was working long hours there. And yeah. um, we had a lot going on family wise in terms of my wife working and our third child was born. So we had a ton going on. Wow. So it was really, it, there was a little bit of pain in there uh, from th at that time, but it was a gift in terms of the financial planning practice to not have a lot of time to mess around. It, I really only had a set number of small hours to get this new firm built and bring some of my existing clients over. And I crazily decided at the same time I was going to get the CFP exam in March of that year. So it was kind of did it all at once, but it was a forking, forcing mechanism, not only then, but as we moved through the years to say, okay, I've only got a little limited time to focus on this financial planning piece, but I can still grow it and still provide a ton of value for clients, even in, in that limited amount of time. And uh, it's just nice to, because I was talking with some other people during that time and they would ask like, oh, have you decided what software you're going to use? What's the CRM? Or what about this compliance piece? Or what about this risk tolerance questionnaire? And my answer would be, I don't know. I, I use Wealthbox because that's what, what came with XY yeah. planning when I signed up. And I use this because it's already set up. And it's, I didn't have time to recreate the wheel. It was just, here's what's established and here's what we're going with. Dave, I, I love that story. And I thank you so much for sharing it because it's an interesting reminder that we all have the same 124 hour, or excuse me, 124 hours in a day, 168 hours in a week, right? And you were in that right. time, like I said, you, you were having your third child, your wife was working full time, you were working 
beyond full time in accounting during tax mm-hmm. season, right? And yet you yep. still manage to get those things done. And I always try to reflect on that. Sorry, if Dave can get all of those things pulled off in the same 24 hours that I can, wh- where exactly am I burning my time? And those examples you gave of, well, how much time am I, am I spending analyzing every possible CRM or every right. possible risk tolerance questionnaire? Uh, yep. So Dave, as you reflect on that time, what were some other key things that maybe you didn't do during that time that let you stay focused? Oh gosh, as you know, when you go to a conference, for example, you get 50 million ideas of things to do. So you come out of those with, okay, I can do this and this and this and this and this. And you quickly figure out maybe a day or two later, I can't do all these things. So whether it's you know looking at this next marketing program or I mean, software is a huge one. Yes. Um, but even just different processes of, okay, when am I going to meet with people? As you talk about with Surge, you really have to bundle that together to be efficient. So you start saying, okay, well, when are people going to be focused on meeting with this? Well, it's probably around tax time. It's probably close to the end of the year. You know, they don't care as much maybe in July about talking with you because they're off doing their summer vacation. So you really have to be intentional about when you're meeting with people and bundling that together into a surge. And then again, not poking around so much on different technologies and, and all this stuff, which they're all good things. Yes, for but sure. I, I think those will come in time as you later have a little bit more time to look into them. Yeah, that's a, that's a good distinction, right? Like, hey, there's, there's a time to examine every possible CRM, but it's not when you're trying to get your first couple of clients. There's not when you're trying to right. build up a firm. I love always talking to accountants about surge meetings because yeah. in, in our industry, it's like this novel concept, like let me group yeah. meetings together. But accountants have been doing that I don't know, for as long as that, you know, for hundreds of years, literally a hundred plus years, right? Grouping meetings around tax season, around the quarterly right. filing deadline. So for people with accounting backgrounds, they say, well, why do you have a name for it? That's just, that's just normal life, right? <laughs> right, right. Well, even if you're not a tax accountant, even if you're in the corporate world, you, know, yeah. you have month end, you have budget season, you have year end, you have certain times where you know it's going to be heavier. Now, the accountants have a bad problem because accountants tend to work long hours and then have surge. So, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to do that, but it's just a matter of, you know, like you said, do accountants surge is... Like, oh, yeah, of course, that's just what we do. Like, there are certain times where you have to be more focused and be more efficient, and you're not going to be taking time off during those times. And so it's not a super new concept to accountants. Dave, how do you today avoid playing office, right? So, you you know, just doing mm-hmm. some math, your kids are still relatively young. Uh, mm-hmm. If you had your youngest in 2015, so you've got a lot of family time, yeah. you still have this practice to run, your accounting to run. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but as a practice evolves, it becomes a little easier, I would say, right? So, but how do you keep yourself today from playing office? Yeah, it definitely much, does. Right? We all still do it some, right? Yeah. But how do you? Absolutely. Yeah, it is always a challenge, no matter where you are in your practice. I think what we've done well is we've been intentional about me transitioning off of doing as much accounting work over time. Mm. So maybe when it first started, you know, 90% of my time was accounting and 10% was financial planning. And then it became... 80, 20, and then 60, 40, and 50, 50. So it's just been, I've been able to steadily pull back. And I think that helps because it's not just, okay, now I'm going to transition to all financial planning and no accounting and have all this time. It's really been a forcing mechanism to say, okay, no, I still have responsibilities here on the accounting piece and I have to be efficient. Otherwise I might eat into that and that business would suffer. So that's been a great forcing mechanism. And Something I would recommend to everybody, really, which is if you absolutely need a forking, forcing mechanism, go get a job and do something to force yourself not to not to just sit around. Because, as you know, when you're just starting a business, that's not a 40 hour a week thing. It's, nope. Unless you are really like hitting the pavement every single day somehow. I mean, it's just not a full time job. Um, so I would say, you know, go get a job, go be a paraplaner part time or help do tax prep. That's kind of what I did. So I'm a little biased, but it's a great way to learn a lot of tax rules and and such if you're actually doing tax prep and CPAs are shorthanded anyway. So they'll take you in if you're smart and know what you're doing. So, you know, just have that forcing mechanism of maybe you do need to get a job. And um, that's not necessarily for everybody because I've seen people where they say, well, my spouse is working full time and generating the income. So I'm just doing this part time for now. And that's fine. That's totally fine if you're intentional about it, right? Um, but it's you don't want to be saying I'm doing it part time and then like you're working at 11 p.m. and on the weekends and doing all sorts of other stuff. So if you're sure, going sure. to do that, be intentional and limit that amount of time. 
Yeah, I when you first put that in in the show notes, this idea of getting a job to force yourself from playing office. At first, I kind of thought, well, well, maybe that's some kind of of joke. But then I thought about it more, and I th- thought that's actually a really good idea, Dave. Especially if you're saying, boy, maybe I'm going to work in tax season, and I'm going to really get a deal. I mean, you, you, there's nowhere you'll get a deeper understanding of tax than mm-hmm. actually doing tax prep. And I think right. it highlights, Dave, and you seem to be really aware of this that that playing office is both a waste of time, but it's also toxic to your success. You kind of just get into this mode of, well, I guess I'll just sort of screw around all day. And it's hard, yeah. to, it's hard to break that cycle. There aren't very many people that can screw around for a couple hours and then suddenly be wildly productive. Usually what yeah. happens is you screw around for a couple hours and then you screw around for a few more hours and maybe you screw around a little bit less, but you're still just, just screwing around. So I, I would say to our listeners, right, to the nation, especially younger advisors, hey, um, yeah, it might seem weird that you're going to go out and get a job, but that might actually be a really good idea. Yeah. Absolutely. And as you and Micah have clarified before, you know, playing office isn't just goofing around. It's not just, you know, scrolling social media or yes. such. There can actually be some things that you know, we think are very helpful, like evaluating software or different things like that, where it's not necessarily that you're doing a bad thing. It's just how much time are you spending on that versus what's really, really needed, what's really going to drive your business forward and what's important to the clients as well. Dave, would you mind if we if we shift gears just a little bit? Would you tell us mm-hmm. a little bit more about how tax planning works in your practice today? Uh, mm-hmm. You know what what that's evolved to, how that looks, especially throughout the calendar year. So right outside of tax season, and, yep. and for those clients that you're doing their actual tax return, how how are you incorporating tax planning throughout the year? Oh yeah, so that's surge really helps with that, obviously. So this time of year, you know, we're shooting this end of February, so we're in the middle of preparing taxes for. Most of our clients, some of them still have their prior CPA doing it because they have a relationship and we're totally fine with that, obviously. Um, But then we're coordinating with them with the tax letters. So we use uh, both the Invictus and Holistaplan have good tax letters that we can use. Um, So, yeah, we look at it in January, send out the tax letter, get that out to clients. Now we're doing the tax return preparation or we are reviewing it if somebody else did it. And then, of course, in the fall, when we do fall surge, we're going to look at that and say, okay, what's the projection look like for this year? And then execute on those in that October, November timeframe. So it's really throughout the year we're talking taxes with clients because it it is just a gigantic piece of their financial puzzle, their retirement, everything. So it's it's been a really big help to have that tax background and be able to talk with people about that really easily. Yeah, and I appreciate you sharing that, Dave, because I, I want to draw out for our listeners, right? Even though, Dave, you have this very, very deep tax background, far above the average advisor, those things that you listed out were not, you know, you didn't say, hey, I'm going to make sure I'm creating intentionally defective grantor trust based in the Cayman Islands, right? These right. are uh, kind of blocking and tackling type things, the, the tax letter, the year-end tax planning, mm-hmm. looking at tax brackets for Roth conversions, reviewing the returns yep. to make sure they're correct. These can sometimes seem like, well, that doesn't really count. But it actually counts for everything. Like if that's not happening, then we yep. can't do the exciting things of, you know, we're going to do some exotic planning. It's really those basic things have got to happen every year. Absolutely. It's stuff that may seem simple to us because we do it all the time. But to the client, it's not simple at all. And as you point out quite often, you have to be able to explain it in a simple manner as well. It's not just enough to, to know it and put it in practice. You have, to, you have to explain it and then you have to make sure that the client is comfortable with it. We're going to do this Roth conversion. You're going to owe this big chunk of tax. Are you okay with paying it? And it's one of those things where when you plan for it and when you talk about it, it sounds fine. When the client actually has to see how much they're paying to the government, it's it's a whole different game. So it's, I feel like every year, I shouldn't say every year, but a lot of years, really, especially the early years of working with the client, there's a little bit extra care that's needed to say, okay, you're, you're going to write this check in taxes. Mm-hmm. Here's the long-term benefit. But it, it takes a little bit of, uh, I don't know, cushioning the message or you know, just being appropriate in how you deliver it to them. It, it's a little bit different in the early years. I feel like after we've done you know, four or five years yes. of working with them and we've got a lot converted already, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're doing that again this year. But yeah, I feel like those early years, they're like, we're going to pay how much in tax right now? It's like, yep, you are. And here's why. Let's go over that again. That's a good reminder, Dave. I think a lot of times when we hear talk about the behavioral side of finance, it's usually related to the markets and it's usually related right. to volatility. But that behavioral aspect, right, the psychological aspect applies just as much, possibly even more to taxes as it does to the market going down, right? We say, oh, you know, we've got to make sure the client doesn't panic when the market goes down. We've also mm-hmm. got to, Dave, to your point, make sure the client doesn't panic or get really upset when they've got to cut that check to the IRS for the Roth conversion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's 
it's a difficult conversation, like I said early on, but it's just an important one to have. Yeah, it's where a lot of our value of, of advisors come out is helping clients do things that emotionally they wouldn't otherwise do. Um, Dave, mm -hmm. something you said earlier in this episode was that you've been sort of transitioning away from the time you spend preparing taxes to the time you spend financial planning. And, and I, I loved how you said, why well, I started from, you know, 90, then 80, then 70%, 60%. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good approach for delegating in general. Sometimes we think we have to go cold turkey, like, hey, I'm going to do all the tax returns one day, I'm going to do zero the next day. But right. how did you walk us through a little bit how you started to make that transition? Right. So when we set this up, it was intentional in that what it gave to our firms overall was I had the accounting background, so I could provide help to the accounting firm. So that way they didn't have to hire, oh, hire sure. number one full time right off the bat. Yeah. So as I kind of phase out, that allow, allows for a little bit more phased hiring over time uh, and also allows me to grow the financial planning business on the other side. So that was very intentional from the start of saying, OK, I can step in and provide lots of help to the accounting firm now. As the financial planning firm grows, I can step off slowly, and that way they don't have to make a hire really earlier than they would want to invest in that. Because as you know, it's, timing out hires is not mm -hmm. super easy, especially when you're starting from you know, employee count of two. So yes. that, that first hire gets pretty expensive when you go, oh man, like are we ready for this? Are we not ready for this? Whereas if I can kind of phase off over time, it really helps to cushion that. Dave, did you have specific milestones attached to that phase? Like, how are you kind of deciding when to take the, the next step on that? Yeah, good question. I, I can't say that we had a specific milestone when we started. I think right now we look at, you know, okay, how much revenue, how much income do we have? When can we make that investment? Uh, to be honest, we were a little slow hiring during the COVID time because that was just a whole bunch of craziness. So oh, yeah. we actually went from a staff of four to a staff of seven during 2022, just because we were so behind in hiring. So uh, so I can't claim that we had some specific milestone. It was more of those, holy cow, we need to hire some people because we're growing, which is a good thing, but uh, we need to be able to provide good service as well. Yeah. Oh, I, I love that. Uh, and I love, again, as I mentioned, that it doesn't have to be a cold turkey thing. There's sometimes we think we have to go 100% one direction or the other, but to mm -hmm. have that plan and and then to have it mapped out, even if you say, hey, it's going to take me two years to phase this out or, or three years or five years or whatever that number to be, mm -hmm. To kind of have say here are the the next steps, even if Dave, as you mentioned, they're not necessarily attached to specific milestones. Right, and we've seen that even in the financial planning business, to where right now, uh, over the past summer, we hired somebody just part time. So we have her for ten hours a week, but help, helping with things like you know TD Ameritrade and all the forms getting set up and you know client move money and all that sort of documentation. It's nice to have her if we get a new client. Say, okay, we need to set them up and we need to get them rolling, and it's not hiring somebody full-time right off the bat, it's, okay, you do this. She works with four or five other advisors as well. So I say, okay, you already know how to do this. Go ahead and do it. We'll jump into that the pool of people that are they're working with you. It's not cold turkey, hire somebody 100%, figure out benefits, do all this stuff. You can phase this in over time. That's great. That's great. Well, Dave, as you look back on these last, I guess now we're, what is, seven years, eight years since uh, 2015, as you've built up your financial planning practice and your accounting practice, what are some lessons, if any, that come to mind where you say, well, I wish somebody would have mentioned this to me in 2015. Like, I really could have saved a lot of headache if somebody would have told me in 2015, fill in the blank. <laughs> well, I, I can't say that nobody told me, but I would have followed <laughs> the a, advice. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we get told lots of things. We think, ah, whatever, you know, I, we can do without that. But uh, just the idea of being more niched in terms of who you work with whether that's accounting, whether that's financial planning, really any industry, the more you can narrow down who you're focusing with and targeting, it not only helps the marketing message, but also helps, as you know, in the execution and the service level that you're providing. Because if you can provide the same thing to a broader number of people, it's not that it necessarily can't be customized to them, but you're not doing the same thing over and over and over and over to different mm -hmm. sets of people. So I think that is one piece of advice that I did not quite heed enough early in that process. But I would, if I had to go back, that's what I would do more is the more you can weed out who you're not going to work with or who, who you're not ideal for. And the more you can focus in on a certain you know, client avatar or client type, whatever you want to call it, uh, I think you're going to make life a whole lot easier in terms of processes and growth. 
Yeah, and, and the great irony there is that early on we have this fear, like if I if I cast my net too narrowly, if I have a niche, I'm leaving out so much of, mm-hmm. the, you know, I can't just narrow myself down to, you know, whatever the niche is, I've got to keep it really wide. And the irony there is the wider the net, the fewer fish you're going to catch, right? And, and the yes. same, I remember early on, uh, somebody once told me, they said, hey, Jarvis, if you were ever under investigation by the SEC, would you call your estate planning attorney for advice? I said, no, I would find an attorney who all they do is SEC work, right? Now, thankfully, I've never found myself faced with that, um, but I do have attorneys that just specialize in that. But same goes for financial advisors, right? Right. A a client wants to find an advisor who understands them, not who Mm -hmm. also does debt management on the side. (laughs) Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my big lesson. I was trying to come in and work with, you know, this group of people and this group of people and this group of people. It's like, no, I can't do all of them. I have knowledge of all those areas. Of course. But I'm really doing them a disservice by spreading myself so thin across so many areas. You can't, you almost can't cast the net narrow enough, really. You can yeah. niche down to anything and be fine. Yeah. I, I've only ever heard hypotheticals where someone was too narrow of, of a niche. Uh, the only other exception I would guess would be every once in a while I run into advisors that pick a wildly unprofitable niche, like a niche that can't right. afford. So, but, but setting aside those two extremes, I'm with yeah. you. I don't think you can get too narrow. So Dave, as you look forward, as you look forward here through 2023, 2024, what do you see, like what's the next strategic initiative you're working on as a firm, either individually you or across your entire firms? Yeah, well, the biggest initiative right now is just growth in the financial planning practice. Uh, So when you ask, okay, how are you going to spend this additional time you have transitioning away from the accounting world and more to the financial planning, it is more of a focus on the business development side and really getting that to grow I've um, been taking a lot of the the advice that you and Micah have provided in terms of working with centers of influence and client events and just all those things that, that are in your book. I can plug your book here. here oh, you want to see you, the yeah. book? There. There's, oh, there's the book. <laughs> oh, there it is. So yeah. For those of you on <laughs> video, I just showed the book. So, yeah. So all those things in the business development world that I really haven't been doing because I haven't felt like I had a ton of time to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, the podcast is another one that, that we have going that's been really helpful. Uh, that's really been the, the big push is just now trying to turn on that growth engine because I feel like we have a lot of good processes in place and we're really ready to go. Yeah, it, it is so critical on the growth engine and you, and you mentioned your podcast. And I know that as of we're recording this, you've recorded a few dozen episodes, right? But to say, hey, these are the reps that I'm going to do every week, right? I'm going to record yeah. an episode every single week or I'm going to reach out to three centers of influence every single week, whatever that number is. But that's mm-hmm. a place that I know I'm terribly guilty of playing office as well. It seems like prospecting is the immediate trigger for playing office, right? Like, well, sure. instead of recording that podcast, I'll do some more research first. Let me do some more research before I record that. And then we, we never get around to it. Right. And as you know, you have to bundle those things together. You don't just record one pad- podcast a week. You record seven or eight and yep. get them done. And that way you've got them for a few months. It's, it's all about being efficient and being intentional with your time. It really is. It really is. Dave, well, I can think of I, I, like a dozen action items that are coming out of this podcast, even things that I want to be implementing on, on my side. Though I, I don't think I'm going to get another job, but then again, I run a couple of companies, so maybe that's the same thing. But as, yeah. as you think about either the things we've talked about today or just in general, what are some real specific action items that you think listeners could take to improve their practice? Certainly. Well, one would be to get a job if you need to, just anything that will restrict your time. And it could also provide good income, good experience. All those things are big benefits. But just if you need to go get a job so that way you're not playing office and spending a lot of extra time on things that aren't going to provide value as you build your financial planning practice. Dave, I I love that action. As I mentioned earlier, I I loved it when I saw that written down. Uh, Just because I mean, Mike and I, as you know, are all about like really assertive action items and bold steps. And I've never thought about that as a step. But it makes it does make a lot of sense. And it would, like you said, it would dramatically improve your tax knowledge. And it would, it would definitely force you to quit playing office. In fact, I don't even think I can think of an action item that one ups that. So I'm really just gonna leave it with that action <laughs> item that uh, that seriously consider no matter where you are in your practice, I would really take a step back and say, what would happen if I had to start working 10 hours a week in another job or 10 mm-hmm. hours a week to do a, a tax trainer, whatever the case may be, how would I change my life? What would have to go? And that was a really interesting exercise to go through. Absolutely. Yes. I love it, Dave. Well, thank you again so much for being on the podcast. Uh, it definitely gave me a lot to think about. Like as I mentioned, I've never thought about that path of getting another job. It's very clever. Uh, thank you to all of our listeners. And until next time, happy planning. Happy planning.